Jack B. Rochester has worked in publishing his entire career as an editor, publisher, and author. He's written over a dozen works of nonfiction, including the national bestseller, The Naked Computer, reviewed in the New York Times, the international bestseller, Pirates of the Digital Millennium, hundreds of newspaper and magazine articles, and short stories and poetry for literary magazines. He is the author of the Nathaniel Hawthorne Flowers Fiction Trilogy, Wild Blue Yonder, Madrone, and Anarchy, all published by Weedmark. Madrone won the 2016 Best Literary Fiction Award from the Independent Publishers of New England. All of his fiction works are available as audio audible books. Jack earned his master's degree in comparative literature from California State University at Sonoma. He was raised in South Dakota and Wyoming and spent many years in California. Please give a warm welcome to Jack. I am, I am very blessed. I get to spend my entire life and my work day filled with literature and reading and analyzing and writing. Uh, it's, just, it's just the greatest thing in the world for me. Um, I read the New York Times Book Review every Sunday, cover to cover. Uh, I review read reviews in the New York Times. Even the Wall Street Journal, believe it or not, has very good book reviews. And I even write a review once a week on my website, Jack Boston. And my, my abiding philosophy about all writing and reading is it boils down to these five words. A good story well told. <laughs> That's what we all want, right? So tonight we're going to talk with uh, talk about uh, some great authors of literary novels. And I want to make that distinction um, uh, right up front too because there's there are a lot of uh, there's a lot of fiction that's written in serial format, as these are, as these three are all trilogies or tetralogies, or uh, even uh, we even have a couple of pentalogies in here. But <clears throat> um, most of the most of the serial literature is mysteries or science fiction or fantasy. What we're talking about tonight is literary um, fiction, and it's more rare. But um, they're all these these three guys. John Updike, John Dos Passos, Philip Roth, great reads. These are great reads. Even if you go outside the trilogies themselves and find other standalone novels, you might want to start with that instead of making a commitment to uh, a trilogy. Except in my case, of course. But you, want, you definitely want to start at the beginning, well, we honor and look, look through the, the trilogy of mine. So. <laughs> but we'll get to that later, OK? So another, another brilliant book that came out 71 was Ihab Hassan's The Dismemberment of Orpheus, which also confirmed the postmodernist view of the anti heroic character in literature. And then, if that wasn't enough, physics started thinking about the same thing <laughs> the laws of thermodynamics. All order, and society as well, tends from order to chaos, right? Right? So that's where literature was going, that's where a lot of art was going, you know. Uh, Atonal music, that sort of thing. Um, there's, so uh, there, there it was. There it was going. It was in the process of entropy. So let's let's take this crazy entropic dystopia idea and talk about these authors a little bit. Okay. When we start the uh, the rabbit series of books, it's the rabbit run. We meet Harry Rabbit Angstrom, the rabbit being very symbolic about his personal nature. Uh, he's 26 years old, he's a big, he was a big basketball state player in high school, and now he lives in a small rural age town in Pennsylvania and it feels extremely trapped by his life and his wife and just can't escape. He, he even jumps in his car one night, takes off and gets all the way down the road and has to turn around and come back because he just cannot, <laughs> cannot let himself do it. Um, He's like a basketball player moving down the court, dun, 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 but he's unaware of the fact that he's his own worst enemy. So Rabbit, it's 1960, Rabbit Run comes out. Um, <laughs> Harry, Harry Rabbit Ashton is, is a salesman, door to door salesman for a potato peeler. <laughs> and he just can't stand his wife. So uh, he starts seeing his prostitute, he gets her pregnant, but um, he, can't, he can't leave his wife. And then, um, 
through an accident that really was or wasn't his fault, who knows, um, his daughter dies, and now he's really, really stuck. Um, and I, I can't help when, when, I, when I'm reading that book and, or thinking about it to think of the U2 song, song uh, I still haven't found what I'm looking for because that's the story of Harry Angstrom's life. He's never found what he was looking for. He never even knew he was looking for something, I think. <laughs> um, 71, Rabbit Redux. Um, um, we stumble into 1971, the hippie age. Um, Harry creates a commune and uh, gets a couple of people interested in it, most prominently a runaway girl named Joe. And uh, he and his son both take a shine to Joe and would like to <clears throat> spend some more time with her. Um, but she's lost in a fire that happens in his house because one of his conservative neighbors hates his guts for starting a commune. Uh, so Jill disappears from the scene, obviously. So we jump ahead to the next decade, 1981, Rabbit is Rich comes out. Um, and the center, Rabbit's personal center and the country's center are just not holding anymore. Uh, and, and Rabbit is for the first time forced to face his own mortality although he struggles against it and tries not to. Uh, and the US is, is struggling as well because it's in the midst of the Iranian oil and gas shortage that it started in the first place. So jumping ahead to 1990, Rabbit at Rest. The title is kind of ambiguous because uh, Rabbit's still unable to manage any relationships, whether illicit or illicit. Um, and it's, he's also living a very hedonistic lifestyle, um, although he doesn't doesn't think about it. <laughs> he's, he's eating all kinds of junk foods and, and drinking um, and uh, has a heart attack. <laughs> so they fix him up, get him going again, but you know most people when they would have a heart attack, you know, maybe that close of a call or death would, would develop a little bit of self-reflection. Oh, not Harry, no way man, not for me. And so of course what happens he continues in his, his wicked, wicked ways. He has another heart attack, and it kills him. He's dead. So um, if this is what we typically call a coming-of-age story, our, hero, our anti-hero, Rabbit Angstrom, uh, it never grows up. He never makes it. Um, and it's, it's a great American irony in concluding reading this book to realize that neither Rabbit nor Janice want to grow up. John Dos Passos, born 1896, died 1970 at the age of 74. I'm going to preface comments about his books by reading from the prologue that he wrote himself for the USA trilogy, series of books, these three books you see here. USA is the slice of a continent. USA is the world's greatest river valley, fringed with mountains and hills. USA Today is a set of big mouth officials with too many bank accounts. USA is a lot of men in their uniforms buried in Arlington Cemetery. USA is the letters at the end of an address when you are away from home. But mostly, USA Today is the speech of a people. Gertrude Stein declared there was a lost generation, and that was these soldiers who came out of World War I and ended up um, artists, in, most of them in Paris. And she called uh, uh, Dos Passos one of the lost generation who was disillusioned by life. And he just, uh, he was, he really was, in, in more ways than just literary, he was a socialist, he was a revolutionary, he was an anarchist. And curiously, in later life, he became very conservative. Voted for Ronald Reagan and Richard Nixon. Oh my God, what are you talking about here? The USA Trilogy is an ambitious patchwork, it's a pastiche, if you will, of different um, stuff that could be criticized for having such a deconstructive organization, but it's still kind of interesting. He has, he has these different segments, there, there aren't chapters per se, but there are breaks in the book where you have a newsreel, and you have a camera eye, and then you have a profile of a person. And um, then you go on to the next newsreel, camera eye, personal profile. Some of the people repeat, some of them don't. Some of you have, you see it, you get to know them one time, and then they're gone. 
So I'm continue on in like volume one, um, the 49th parallel, and might make a leap one or two of them over into uh, 1911, but don't go on to the third volume. Um, so it's, he's just he's just not he's not he doesn't have a linear or a logical pattern that is except for the fact there are these three elements over and over repeated. Um, but it's deconstruction, right? We're talking about deconstruction here, and he, hey. You, know, you learn this stuff about this one person, but now they're gone. We're on to another person. So <clears throat> um, what's interesting about once you get past the, those kind of heading kinds of things about his writing, he likes to run words together. The Ghostwriter um, is the first volume, and <clears throat> um, uh, we're immediately introduced by introduced to uh, the three major themes in Roth's work, which are sex, death, and family issues. Um, uh, you know, the, the ghostwriter isn't written about a ghostwriter. Um, you know what a ghostwriter is, right? Somebody who writes somebody else's books. Um, but it's, it's more like about um, a, a ghost that might or might not be inhabiting uh, the three characters in the novel, Nathan, who at this time is a young, unpublished author, E.I. Lanoff, his mentor idol, who may or may not be his surrogate father, and a young woman who may or may not be Anne Frank. <laughs> and so we're like, oh, okay, all right, we're off and running here. Um, what are we gonna do with this? So um, we have yeah, the opportunity to make many interpretations of the work at this point, but Zuckerman, um, we soon realize what he wants to do is write Lanoff's coattails. He wants Lanoff to endorse him or bless him or in some way help him get his career off the ground. And Lanoff is just so completely into himself, so reclusive. He's kind of like J.D. Salinger, to tell you the truth. Um, but um, he, he, he just refuses to get involved with Zuckerman at that level. And then thrown into the mix here is the, uh, the character Amy Billette, who we think may or may not be Anne Frank, and like, what is she doing here? You know, she, the age is right. Um, did Anne Frank go into hiding and she didn't die in, um, in Germany? Um, what happened here? So um, what we have is Roth doing this thing with masks that I just love. You know, everybody's wearing a mask. It's like the, the two masks of uh, tragedy and comedy. In these three volumes, and certainly in other works by Roth, his narcissism and his misogyny are just on full display. He, he's just letting it all hang out. But you gotta remember these were written 40, 50 years ago. Life was different then. We had different attitudes about a lot of stuff. We had no Jeffrey Epstein's at the time. Oh. Um, but um, Roth, even though he may or may not have been a, a narcissist, or may not have been may or may not have been a misogynist, misogynist excuse me, um, he's still a great writer. He's just an absolutely great writer. Just, you just keep turning the pages. You can't put it down. So here's, here's the way it shakes up. Wobble Yonder takes place between the years 1965 and 69, the four years that Nathaniel or Nate spends in the U.S. Air Force. So Wobble Yonder ends with him getting out of the service, coming back to Chicago. His mother wants him to live with her in the apartment and, and help pay the rent. And he's got two little brothers at home. <clears throat> and he's like, oh my god. Um, and meanwhile, waiting out on the West Coast for him is this beautiful, blonde, blue-eyed girl who fell in love with him like crazy in a creative writing class that they were taking together. And She's not asking him to come back, um, but she's she's waiting, and he knows she's waiting, and so he says, oh, that sounds a little bit better to me than hanging out here at home in an apartment in Chicago with my mom. So he jumps on a train, and as, as Wobbly on her ends, he's getting on that train to go to California, and as the drone begins, he's just gotten off that train, and there's Jane standing there waiting for him, and they rush into each other's arms, and off we go. As uh, the third volume, Anarchy, begins, um, one of Nate's fellow troops from Germany has written him a letter saying, 
hey, I'm coming to see you. And he's not really excited about this. This guy's name is Tim Rosenkrantz. And when they were in Germany, Tim was uh, an open, openly uh, uh, unabashed socialist and communist. He received copies of Pravda in his US Air Force mailbox every two weeks. Um, he would he would get troops assembled out on the on the uh, uh, parade ground and read to them from chairman uh, quotations from Chairman Mao. Okay, the guy was a total radical, and so Nate's a little bit. Mm, I don't know about this guy, but there's not much he can do about it. So he tries to coerce Nate into joining him and becoming um, a, a member of Weatherman and a bomber, which was a big thing that was happening back in 1969, 70, 71. Weathermen were bombing on average five public buildings a day. So <clears throat> it's, um, it's quite, uh, quite a, and the story just wound up tighter and tighter and tighter. It was like a $2 alarm clock. And um, the ending, of course, I'm not gonna tell you what it is, but um, it's, it's pretty intense. And uh, it comes to a, a, a very dramatic conclusion. All right, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.